So I am Peter Shergold, and I am part of that dying breed of economic historians. More particularly, I am a sort of dying economic historian. <laughs> a cursory perusal of the purposeful life of Kenneth Stuart Cunningham, after whom this prestigious oration is named, does not suggest much acquaintance with failure. Certainly, there is evidence of adversity overcome, penuriousness, which prevented him from studying medicine, of opportunity seized, which set him on his path from life as a junior teacher to becoming a pioneer of Australian education, and first-hand experience of tragic futility, which deeply affected him as a stretcher bearer for the Fifth Field Ambulance during the First World War. Perhaps his avowed cautiousness enabled him to avoid mistakes. Perhaps his undemonstrative nature meant that he kept them to himself. But when Cunningham became the first president of the Social Scientist Research Council in Australia from 1942 to 53, there is little evidence that he reached that position on the back of a lifetime of acknowledged failure from which he had learned. Moving from the personal to the pedagogical, I will argue that this lack of reflection on the experience of failure is symptomatic of the social scientist, at least relative to the popular interest evinced by the wider public. Asser has recently done a first-rate job of promulgating the story of how social scientists have helped to shape our nation the utility of their research is evident in many areas of public policy, from water management and urban planning and taxation, to diversionary justice and tobacco consumption and welfare. Unfortunately, their efforts do not always have such impact. The manifold mistakes of public policy in part reflect the failure of academic research to influence sufficiently its design and implementation. Yet the nature of such failure is rarely central to scholastic inquiry. So here, rather grandly, is my thesis. The diverse disciplines of social science apply their various methodologies to better understand human society. The insights they afford help us to comprehend the manner in which people act, make decisions, wield power, and seek to influence their world. Yet a key characteristic of relationships, the experience of failure, has aroused comparatively little academic interest. This, I have to admit, isn't a recent insight. Some two decades ago, the Journal of Sociology published an article which reflected on the fact that failure is a ubiquitous and central feature of social life, yet sociological inquiry tended to focus on success. Since then, the extent to which sociologists have analysed failure is not always in a manner that lends itself to real-world solutions. A recent study in the American Journal of Sociology reflected on the limits of knowledge and the nature of inevitable failure examining a fatal air crash. It argued against a realist epistemology in which technological knowledge could be objectively knowable. The conceptual approach, I have to tell you, doesn't lend itself to the provision of frank and fearless policy advice. I can imagine the conversation with a minister. What the hell went wrong, she asks. Minister, Unfortunately, the answer is unknowable, except in a constructivist sense. <laughs> At a more pragmatic level, there is, in the fields of business and management, a growing academic literature which examines the nature of organisational failure. Not surprisingly, the scholarly literature on failure is most extensive in the field of psychology. Almost half a century ago, Robert Burney wrote fear of failure. Since then, the integrated cognitive psychology 
of interpersonal behaviour has not infrequently been applied to the recognition of failure and its impact on the sense of individual self-worth. Some research explores forms of failure I had never even contemplated. Judith Halberstrom's The Queer Art of Failure examines counterintuitive forms of resistance to capitalist heteronormative conventionality. Jesper Dewar, The Art of Failure, is an essay on the pain experienced playing video games. If there is a singular weakness to my thesis of relative academic disinterest, it is, of course, last week's announcement that the 27 no, uh, 2017 Nobel Prize for Economics was awarded to Richard Thaler for his path-breaking work on behavioral science. Here, in a sense, is a whole body of social science founded on a particular form of failure, the inability of human beings to behave in an economically rational fashion when they make decisions. Market outcomes turn out to be the manifestation of our social preferences, which so often reflect, I think, our rather pleasing lack of forward-thinking self-control and the mistakes we generally make in succumbing to short-term temptation. The implications for public policy are profound. If we want people to look after their health or save for their old age, governments need to nudge them to take less biased, more pro-social courses of action. Otherwise, human beings, us, will neither recognise our poor judgement nor learn from it. Clever interventions are needed to address human fallibility. After a lifetime of experience, men will continue to use a urinal accurately. But if a small black fly is etched on the porcelain for them to aim at, it turns out that spillage decreases by 80%. Thaler argues that we need to be given direction, and obviously, it turns out, sometimes literally. <laughs> His insights have transformed economics. And yet, I believe the thrust of my argument still holds. Public interest in failure is greater than amongst social scientists. Browse the motivational self-help section of any major bookstore, and failure is remarkably well represented. You are likely to find the art of failure. Failure is an option. The gift of failure. Fail smart. Why people fail. The upside of down. Why failing well is the key to success. And the way of failure. Winning through losing. Failure intelligence sells. People seek an essential guide for mastering failure. And written media tell a similar story of public enthusiasm for failure. The popular magazine, Psychology Today, is much more likely than scholarly journals to highlight the issue, as in 10 surprising facts about failure. So too broadcast media. BBC Radio has this year broadcast a five-part series on the value of failure. It includes the cricketer Ed Smith reflecting regretfully on his failure to play more than three times for England. And so too, social media. The benefits of failure are now an indispensable part of the TED Talk playlist. They are prominent on Facebook and WeChat. They are embedded in YouTube. The life hacker Twitter and blog, launched in 2005, often addresses the challenge of personal failure. My own view, however, is that the posts on learning from mistakes are rather less engaging than those on the easiest way to manipulate people into doing what you want, which is, of course, recommended reading for senior public servants. In short, I sense that the subject of failure creates more interest in society than in the social sciences. Great blunders in history. 
was a long-running series on television that was dominated by a plethora of military catastrophes and political bungles and ferry sinkings and aircraft crashes. Other television programs, such as Funniest Home Videos and Science of Stupid, reveal how endlessly hilarious it is to see people injuring themselves in rather predictable ways. Lists, lists of failure are particularly popular. Business Insider, in its 25 worst mistakes in history, focuses on the corporate world of terrible mergers, oil spills, nuclear meltdowns, and illicit sexual affairs. Online, the 25 biggest and most embarrassing mistakes ever made range from Decca Records turning down the Beatles to the Dutch discovering Australia a hundred years before the British, but ignoring it because it was a useless desert. Stories, stories of the embarrassing mistakes of celebrities are a staple of social media. Many, particularly those involving unfortunate cosmetic surgery or appalling fashion sense, seem irredeemable. The stories are entertaining. But more importantly, if told right, they are also inspiring. I discern a revealed preference for shows about individuals who are able to overcome their errors. Watch Cupcake Wars, and it is apparent that in the early stages of baking competition, the contestants all make mistakes, but quite explicitly, the champion is often the person who has exhibited to the judges not the best cake, but the greatest capacity to learn from their earlier pastry failures. A typical online site not only identifies 12 famous people who failed, but also shows how with perseverance they overcome their setbacks. They range from Thomas Edison and Henry Ford to Katy Perry and Oprah Winfrey. Most uplifting, I found, was the story of the rapper Jay-Z, whose litany of mistakes included stabbing a guest at a record release party. <laughs> but, but he never gave up. No matter what happened to him, no matter what failures he faced, he pushed through, growing as a person and maturing to become a better individual. Now, of course, none of this is new. The sentiment that pervades the digital world would have been familiar to Horatio Alger Jr., the popular and prolific 19th century author, most of whose stories involve impoverished boys, rather like Jay-Z, overcoming social barriers and personal failures and rising from rags to riches. Alger, of course, had his own secret sin that he fought to overcome. He was an admitted child molester who sought to atone for his sexual urges by becoming a prominent voice for abandoned children in New York City, many of whom he looked after in his own home. It is this sense of redemption today as 150 years ago that drives self-help manuals to address the experience of failure far more enthusiastically than academic text. Their repetitive themes are readily apparent. Failure is an inevitable and necessary part of life. Its occurrence is just opportunity in disguise. It is a crucial driver of success. Through its life-altering lessons, it makes us into better people. And most encouragingly, it is the more successful people who have failed the most times. Now, th these motifs, too, have a long and distinguished history. Samuel Smiles, the 19th century Scottish reformer who espoused thrift and personal discipline as the basis for self-help, was a great believer in the virtue of failure. We learn wisdom from failure much more than from success, he argued. He who never made a mistake never made a discovery. And his embrace of the virtues of failure remain popular on the website Brainy Quotes. But today, his epigrammatic wisdom 
is placed alongside that of more contemporary figures. J.K. Rowling, invited to give the Harvard commencement address, told the graduating students, most of whom had probably learned to read by following the adventures of Harry Potter, that it is impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you might as well not have lived at all, in which case you failed by default. <laughs> Michael Jordan, the giant of basketball, takes, you'll be pleased to know, a more quantitative approach. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to make the shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again, and that is why I succeed. The ethos of success through failure has become, of course, a key part of management speak. Attend any young leaders conference, and you'll be likely to sit through at least one PowerPoint presentation in which failure will be extolled in the official jargon of corporate improvement. It'll probably run along the lines of, we stand on a burning platform. Together we need to leverage our strengths and overcome our weaknesses. It's important that we don't waste this crisis. Think of it as an opportunity. Of course we'll get things wrong as we go. That's okay. Mistakes are proof we're trying. If we fail, let's fail quickly. We'll learn from the experience and eventually we'll succeed. I know this because I've given some of these speeches myself. <laughs> the stimulating virtue of mistakes may be important to corporate managerialism, but it shines as a bright beacon of revelatory inspiration to start up entrepreneurialism. Hundreds, literally hundreds of autobiographies of successful business leaders pay homage to the value of this, their place in learning from their early failures. Think cupcakes mass produced. Let me provide just two examples that characterize an entire oeuvre of inspirational business literature. Phil Knight, recently published Shoe Dog, an account of how he created Nike. According to its back cover, I'm sorry, that's all I've read, you can read a memoir that's surprising, humble, unfiltered, funny and beautifully crafted, which details the many terrifying risks, the crushing setbacks, as well as many thrilling triumphs and narrow escapes. Or peruse The Secrets of My Success, by Janine Alice, the Melbourne-based suburban mother who turned her smoothie business into a global boost juice empire. Janine has suffered many failures along the way, including, memorably, being unable to answer a simple question on family feud. The question was, think of an item made out of glass. Janine's answer, glass. Anyway, pick up her book, and it's easy because it always sits on the counter where you're ordering your mango magic. And there you'll find highlighted an essential message. One of the great shames in business is when budding entrepreneurs give up. The shame is not in their failure. It is in the fact that had they kept trying, they would have learned so much and their next venture might have been a success. That sense of the veil value of failure has spawned an entire global business movement. Earlier this year, I was asked to visit The Hague to give a presentation to Dutch public servants on the lessons to be learned from organisational failure. I was startled and somewhat disconcerted on arrival at the venue to see posters, this is one of them, promoting a fuck-up night. I was somewhat relieved to discover that the notices were for an alternative function <laughs> on the same evening, same evening. But I was interested to find out more. So fuck-up nights, I have now discovered, are held for aspiring entrepreneurs. As of last month, 
They have been held in 252 cities in 80 countries and have provided a platform for 1,578 narratives of professional failure. Stories of businesses that crash and burn, the partnership deal that goes sour, the products that has to be pulled. These are the business disasters from which enthusiastic audiences can learn. So in popular culture then, failure fulfills two important roles. It can strike down those public figures whom we have come to believe have grown too big for their boots, providing a warm sense of schadenfreude as we bask in the warm glow of their misfortune. Conversely, it can test the fortitude of those whom we admire providing them with an education in the University of Hard Knocks upon which their eventual success can be built. Struggling with our own lives of quiet desperation, we can find their resilience a source of inspiration because none of us want to go to the grave with the song still in us. That sense of possibility can be just as stimulating in the University of Bricks and Mortarboards. Just as in entrepreneurship. Trial and error is, of course, a key part of scientific experimentation and social science empiricism. We test hypotheses, find them wanting, try again. The winner of last night's PM's Prize for Excellence in Science Teaching, Neil Bramson, has described this rather wonderfully as failing forward. Indeed, at times, scientific failure can be serendipitous alchemy and be transmuted into success. Think, for example, of the happenstance by which penicillin and dynamite and saccharin and cosmic microwave radiation and, of course, Viagra were discovered. Such insights are not just a result of good luck. As Louis Pasteur reflected, in the field of observation, chance favours only the prepared mind. By which circuitous route, let me now introduce myself to you as the 1,579th story. After all, I've had a moderately successful career built on countless false starts, um, diversionary enthusiasms, inconsequential mistakes, and egregious errors of judgment. It has become clear to me that failure takes many forms. So it's through rich experience rather than academic insight. I've come to appreciate the distinctive variations and unexpected guises. Let me, in keeping with the quantitative traditions of popular culture, suggest to you that there are five distinctive forms of failure. My focus, given my background, will be on the public sector. The first. The first is failure of implementation. This is a common manifestation both in the popular literature of business acumen and in more scholarly accounts of failures in medical practice or systems engineering or accident prevention or organisational behaviour. It is at the heart of the report that I provided to the Commonwealth Government in 2015 on why the rollout of the home insulation programme turned out to be so tragically disastrous. My assessment was presented as learning from failure, colon. Colons are absolutely vital in social science. <laughs> colon. Why large government policy initiatives have gone so badly wrong in the past and how the chances of success in the future can be improved. The title provides a clue to my indebtedness to the great political scientist, Aaron Wildowski, who in 1973 had written his own masterpiece of failure, Implementation, How Great Expectations in Washington Are Dashed in Oakland, or Why It's Amazing That Federal Programs Work at All. <laughs> My argument was not that the two policy ideas that inspired the federal government to install pink bats in the roofs of Australian homes were inherently wrong. 
undertaken correctly, the program could have provided economic stimulus at a time of financial crisis, and the form of employment created might have contributed some modest environmental benefit. Unfortunately, program management from design to execution was incompetent. Accountability for decision-making was unclear, and risk management was weak and ill-directed. The consequence was execution failure. Such poor implementation has a long tradition in officialdom. Think most recently of the ABC e ABS e-census or the Centrelink robo-debt program. But public service failures can, of course, be matched in the private sector. Remember, most typically, the periodic malfunctions of IT systems that beset airlines and banks and telecommunication companies. All major projects, public and private, have strategic and financial and operational and regulatory risks. Public service culture, however, has a particular tendency to extol the design of policy and the provision of policy advice far above the importance of its execution. The public bears the consequence in terms of poor implementation. If projects are managed badly, the results can be not only costly, but catastrophic. Four young men died because of the manner in which the home insulation program was rushed out too soon with inadequate controls by inexperienced and poorly informed administrators. But failure is a two-edged sword. There is a second form of mistake, failure of ambition. Too often, action is taken too slowly, with too much caution. I've borne witness to many worthwhile public policy ideas that were never allowed to develop beyond a few pilot projects. I have, on occasion, railed against the failure of courage and nerve, the inherently bureaucratic risk aversion that results in too many exciting innovations remaining at the periphery of public administration. Jeff Mulgan, who was head of policy in the Prime Minister's office in the UK, has also had first-hand experience of this intriguing paradox. This is what he says. Governments often do too slowly what should be done fast, and fast what should be done slowly. Failure to act may be less visible than failure to implement effectively, but its long-term consequences can be far greater. Cautious procrastination imposes opportunity costs. In Learning from Failure, I argue the need for experimentation as the basis of more agile and adaptive forms of government. The key is to incorporate ongoing evaluation of the manner in which programs deliver the results intended by the policy. If a bold idea emerges, trial it quickly in a small way to demonstrate its impact. If it is unsuccessful, cease it. If it needs improvement, change it. If it works, scale it up. Mitigate the risks as you go. Both acting too fast and too slow are often attributable to a third characteristic failure of imagination. Projects can be rolled out successfully and yet still be adjudged a failure. Government programs are often delivered through good processes with guidelines followed and grants acquitted and contractual conditions met. Yet too often, they have little beneficial impact in terms of goals achieved. Results do matter. That's why I strongly believe that the commissioning of public services should take place on the basis of performance-based outcomes. Iterative, iterative evaluation needs to be given the same priority as traditional end of implementation auditing. My criticism, however, runs deeper, much deeper. I've spoken and written about it in terms of what I've called a public service revolution only half fulfilled. And I have played my part in that failure to capture the full benefits of a reform process. 
As Secretary of the Department of Employment in the second half of the 1990s, I oversighted the creation of Job Network, a 50-year-old government monopoly, the Commonwealth Employment Service, was replaced by a competitive market of public, private and not-for-profit providers that delivered the Australian government's labour market programmes. It could easily have failed in the early years, but I proved my competence by ensuring that it didn't. Proudly, I spoke publicly of the network's success. Employment placements were being delivered by the contracted organisations at lower outcome cost than had been achieved by the CES. Early results were encouraging, mistakes were made, but the new system survived. Two decades later, the network continues to function, although today it's called Job Active. So where's the failure? Well, the failure, in measure my own, might best be portrayed as lack of foresight, the inability fully to comprehend the extensive range of benefits that could come about from the outsourcing of government service delivery. By the time I left the Australian Public Service 10 years ago, I already recognised that a more radical transformation of public service delivery should not be based on contract management, but on cross-sectoral collaboration. There existed this wonderful opportunity for the government's contracted intermediaries to become real, genuine partners in the creation of public impact. That opportunity was lost. It can still be regained. Failure of implementation often comes about because policy advisers are too little influenced by the valuable frontline experience of junior public servants and community workers in the design of programs. Failure of imagination most typically results from the advisor's inability to recognise the full potential of innovation. It stymied the capacity for co-design and co-production of government policy. In my speeches, but more so in my actions, I'm now seeking to set in place public, private, uh, community partnership as a means of shaping new government programmes and not just as a means of delivering existing programmes at lower cost. That's what I'm trying to do as Coordinator General for Refugee Resettlement in New South Wales. But here's the thing. Given the intellectual persuasiveness and the passionate elucidation of my arguments, why the heck has it proved so difficult for me to convince governments to change the way they do their business? In part, I believe, because of a fourth dimension, the failure of cultural inertia. Think of this as the manner in which imagination is framed and constrained at an organisational level. It happens in the private and community sectors, but there it is periodically challenged by entrepreneurs who take risks, often fail, but are sometimes successful in establishing new businesses or new social enterprises that threaten the power of incumbency. That competitive challenge is harder to achieve in a public sector setting. Traditional modes of thinking are less subject to outsider pressure. Perhaps cultural inertia exists also in academia. Indeed, the University of Sydney has just launched a new brand marketing campaign based upon its capacity to help students overcome the failure of unchallenged educational assumptions. The, the promotional public hoardings that I see around Sydney illustrate the university's commitment to unlearning, as in unlearn medicine, photo of a marijuana plant, unlearn criminal justice, photo of a woman's pink varnished fingernails tightly gripping prison bars, and unlearn love, rather predictively, a photo of two men about to tie the knot. The explanatory blurb explains that there's one important lesson most of us never get, a lesson in unlearning. 
Unlearning is about challenging the established and questioning the accepted. Students are encouraged to demolish social norms and build new ones. Of course, many on the right of politics see this avowed unlearning as simply another form of groupthink indoctrination, a striking example of how successful the cultural left has been in subverting the academy. In Gerard Henderson's view, the social science areas of most Australian and most American tertiary institutions are conservative free zones where academics tend to agree with one another in a leftist kind of way. Unlearning from this perspective is symptomatic of the modern university's ethos. It is just as culturally bounded by as the social norms it, it seeks to challenge. I do not subscribe to such cavalier characterizations any more than I accept the far too common criticism by social scientists that public service leadership has become dominated by neoliberal managerialists of an economically rationalist persuasion. Certainly, they are not the manifestations of cultural consensus that I fear may fail our citizens. Rather, it is unquestioned perceptions of the nature of democratic governance that can bring us undone. I've already talked to the manner in which the success of the contract state has undermined the potential of cross-sectoral collaboration to create public impact. Let me give just two other very different examples. I worry that the empowering potential of consumer-directed care in government will fail, not just because of ineffective administration, but as a result of inadequate vision. I'm concerned that the concept represents too radical a prospect relative to the manner in which service agencies perceive Australians who require safety net support. If those in need, citizens in need, continue to be treated as passive dependents and recipients, rather than as individuals with the capacity to con take control of their own lives, this bold initiative is gonna fall at the first hurdle. I fear too, that the power of cognitive technology and robotic process transformation and machine learning and voice recognition will be limited to the creation of more efficient administration and that the ambition of governments will fail to embrace technology's capacity to create new forms of digital democracy. It is for such reasons that I strongly argue that the public service needs to be opened up to new ideas Barriers to the entry and exit of people and ideas need to be made more porous. Academic research, especially from the social sciences, needs to have greater impact on the design of government policy. It is true, as Asa has recently highlighted, that social scientists can have a positive effect on public policy. But too often relevant scholarship is lost in translation its insights trapped in peer-reviewed journals, and its authors unable or unwilling to influence the decisions of governments. Business, community, and university leaders need to be afforded more opportunity to work in the public sector. Conversely, public servants should be encouraged to gain experience outside government. Most provocatively, I have recommended a Hollywood model of working, in which groups of talented individuals from diverse backgrounds are brought together to address a particular public policy challenge, and then, once the task is completed, depart once more, just as they do after the completion of a movie. In this way, the implicit assumptions common to, private, to public sector workplaces might more readily be challenged and the sclerotic impact of cultural inertia be overcome. Institutional mores too often limit in invisible ways the perception of what is possible. The online inspirational epigrams have one ready just for this eventuality. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. I'm happy to quote it in my speeches. It has the undeniable ring of truth. 
but not, I think, the whole truth. There is a fifth form of failure, although it manifests itself in all four of the variations that I've already identified. It is personal failure. Academics know it well. I experience it at first hand at Western Sydney University. Each year I participate in a speed dating session with young female staff. I'm given just 10 minutes to proffer sage advice to bright and enthusiastic early career academics who too often feel overwhelmed by their perceived sense of failure. They struggle to balance their research and their teaching and their administration and their personal lives. That misplaced sense of underachievement is what prompted Johannes Haushofer, a highly regarded professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton, to publish his curriculum vitae of academic failure, the jobs for which he was rejected, the grants he failed to win, the articles he wrote but were rejected. It became an instant viral success. His purpose was to illustrate how the failure of successful academics was too often invisible to others, with the consequences that they are more likely to attribute their own failures to themselves, rather than the fact that the world is stochastic, applications are crapshoots, and selection committees and referees have bad days. In this instance, as Professor Haushofer later reflected ruefully, his success was a form of failure. His CV of disappointments became far more widely read and influential <laughs> than his distinguished academic record. But partly as a result of his openness, the self-help ethos has now breached the walls of the ivory tower. As Asa reminds us, social scientists exhibit the usual vagaries of human frailty. Perhaps they will be encouraged by online articles now that highlight the fact that unsuccessful endeavours are a crucial part of academia, academia. Use these five tips to turn them to your advantage. Stories of failure have now become a staple of the website established in 2013 by Nathan Hall, Professor of Education and Counselling Psychology at McGill University. It can be Googled as shit academics say. Its Facebook page now has more than half a million followers. Meanwhile, the popular website Jobs on Toast, a guide to higher education, higher as in H-I-R-E, regularly features articles on topics such as how to recognise and overcome the failure story after your PhD. Perhaps Glenn Withers could draft a companion piece, How to Live with Yourself When You Fail to Get Elected to the Academy. There is a more serious consequence to avoiding failure in academic life. Evidence indicates that at least in medicine, randomised control trials are on occasion used to suggest beneficial results in spite of statistically non-significant outcomes. Science is being spun in order to turn failure into success. The pressure to publish or perish or to win the competition for research funds has contributed to an increase in the number of scientific articles having to be retracted. One person's cheating, of course, is another person's opportunity. Stanford academics in communication have now developed an obfuscation index to try and identify over-optimistic authors by analysing the language with which they present their results. This idea of personal failure is dangerous terrain. It may suggest a genetic disposition or a weakness of character that in an earlier era was often used to explain the sad lives of ne'er-do-wells. Scott Sandridge's Born Losers, A History of Failure, explores the lives of ordinary people who bit the dust in order to reveal how failure evolved from a business loss to a personality deficit, from a career setback to a gauge of self-worth. Failure, unmatched by later success, is increasingly perceived as a sign of intellectual or moral incapacity. That, that certainly is not my intent. Rather, my interest is in self-awareness. 
I refer to the failure of individuals to take responsibility or be held accountable for mistakes when they happen. This thought was what prompted my recent newspaper article published as Mia Culpa, Failure as the Foundation of Leadership. My argument is that whilst employees are now routinely taught to accept the need to learn from mistakes, they are often unwilling to do so. Oh, they are often willing to do so only to the extent that they can avoid acknowledging the errors as their own. It's too easy to attribute the causes of failure and the lessons to be learned to poor systems and structures and processes of organisational decision making or to the baleful collective leadership culture within which one was forced to operate. It's far harder to look in the mirror and accept one's personal contribution to a debacle. In my piece, I reflect publicly on the nature of the personal failure I feel when I look back on my role in the administration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. It was, I discern, a failure to conceive how to build a stronger foundation for genuine Indigenous participation in decision making, an incapacity to fully recognise the sad reality of so-called self-determination and the inability to deliver financial support and community services in a manner that did not reinforce passive welfare programs. Most importantly, I failed to persuade others to act to properly address such issues, either in policy divine or program delivery. The eminent Aboriginal leader Noel Pearson only half-jokingly suggested that my seminal admission should require that I be obliged to answer for these failures before an appropriate tribunal. That response reminds me that it is not comfortable to come to terms with evidence of personal failure. Yet I've discovered to, to identify and assess dispassionately one's own role in failures can be a liberating express, uh, experience, both for oneself and for an audience. That, after all, is the worldwide attraction of fuck-up nights. I am already embracing the concept, if not the profane language. Indeed, the most popular after-dinner speech that I now present to public servants is an account of the greatest mistakes I ever made. The more that I identify the more favourably my presentation is judged. Inspired by such success, I'm already working on my next motivational address. I have its title. Failure. Making mistakes is so beneficial to academic success that you should make a few more just for their entertainment value. I remain hopeful of securing funding support from the AIC. Unfortunately, as I've heard this afternoon, their processes are slow and my life expectancy is decreasing. I am therefore grateful for this opportunity to address you this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. I don't know whether to be uh, depressed or elated by uh, what we've, we've heard this evening. It's uh, uh, a mix of, of thoughts that uh, we will have to digest. Uh, but I do remember uh, in the New Yorker a uh, Ferber cartoon that had a, a man sitting by uh, the sidewalk of a small coffee table. He was reflecting on his, his life and he was saying that I, I loved a woman and I proposed marriage to her but she rejected me but I learnt from the experience. And then there's a second Ferber cameo with the same man sitting there saying, I met another woman and she was so lovely and I wanted to be with her, but she rejected me. And then there's a third and fourth cameo where this, this keeps going on. He said, you know, I think of myself as the renaissance man of the rejectees. <laughs> <laughs> So he's learnt from the experience. Uh, there was a book by Calvin Thompson, one called um, uh, Living Well is the Best Revenge. Uh, Peter would have it as Failing Well is the Best Revenge. 
and we look forward to the book version uh, for its inclusion in the QS now rankings, as we understand it, uh, as long as it's not too many chapters by other people. So uh, we, we uh, would anticipate this, Peter, for the future. Um, the, uh, I, I'm also now uh, in, in, enamoured with the notion of uh, UHK, which I'd always thought of as the University of Hong Kong, as a wonderful university. It's now the University of Hard Knocks in my mind after uh, uh, hearing Peter's uh, uh, presentation. And I did love myself in, uh, in economics. Uh, there was an issue of the Journal of Economic Perspectives where they got the Nobel Prize winners in economics together and they talked about their rejected articles. And, and how they felt and what they did as a result, exactly the analogous experience to one uh, you described. So it's, uh, it's very uh, insightful. So thank you so much, Peter, for uh, taking us uh, through this journey. I think it's one we're gonna ponder for ourselves as well. Uh, and it's one that uh, we're very pleased to have uh, learned from you tonight based on, on that experience uh, you've had in your applied life in the social sciences. So. Uh, we, we are uh, deeply grateful and we have a certificate of appreciation to present to you tonight. Thank you very much.